joy to see you here. Um, I'm Megan, Megan Reedy. I host these um, for the Maine Charitable Mechanics Association. So yeah, welcome to Makers at the Hall and to this library. It's one of my very favorite rooms in Portland. And the fresh paint, I notice, it used to be blue in here of all colors. Um, yes, you can tell, you can tell um, that it just got painted in here. Um, one thing I always like to let people know is that this is, like, I don't know if it's the only library in Maine, but there is a current card catalog. So if you need to just browse a card catalog, um, come here and do it. And there's actually the book on the shelf that matches up. Um, a little bit about um, the Maine Charitable Mechanics Association. I imagine some people know plenty about it. I see a few familiar faces here. Um, this organization has been here a long time. It was founded in the, the Maine Charitable Mechanics was founded in 1815. This building's from 1857. Um, the mechanic associations were a nationwide, um, a global phenomenon for a while. This is one of the last ones, I think a lot of the rest are in Australia of all places, that is still what it was to start with, an organization of makers for makers. Um, many of them, you'll notice, have turned into concert halls, libraries, all sorts of other things, but this one is still here trying to do this thing to bring people together who make stuff and see what happens when we do that. Um, this Makers at the Hall happens the last Wednesday of every month. It's a moment when we have a chance to we invite in um, some of the, and one by one, the extraordinary makers of Maine. And it's a great opportunity for us to get together, um, to hear from, talk with um, that maker, but also with each other, inspire each other, connect with each other, see what we might do together. Um, if you are interested, if you're not a member already, membership is cheap, um, just 25 bucks a year for an individual. And yeah, that's part of its goal too, is to, is to bring us together, um, this organization. So, um, without any further ado, I'm going to hand us over to the maker of the evening, Pilar Nadal. She's a master crib maker um, right here in Portland, um, Pickwick Independent Press. She is director of that fabulous establishment. I point like that because it's right across the street, literally. And if there's interest, um, oh, did I point in the wrong direction? Yeah. Yeah. I always point yeah. according to my own personal map. Um, it's across the street, wherever the street is. And if there's interest at the end of the evening, um, Pilar would be happy to take folk across to see the wonders inside, if you haven't seen them already. The way the evening's going to play out, um, I'll hand it over. She'll say all the fabulous things she has to say show all sorts of fabulous pictures. We'll have plenty of time to chit chat with her afterwards, question and answer. Um, we will then fold the screen, this wine and cake behind there, and then a tour if you like. All right, so good morning. Excellent, yeah. hello. Hi everybody. Um, I'm Pilar Nadal, and um, thank you very much for that fantastic introduction, and um, thanks very much for inviting me here. I love this space. I've been here a few times. So yeah, so I am the director of Pickwick Independent Press, and Pickwick Independent Press is right across the street that way. <laughs> We're on the, can we actually see it? Almost. Um, no, we can't. But uh, we're on the second floor, right above Space Gallery. And um, we started in 2009, September of 2009. So we're eight and a half years old. Um, we started down the street, um, what used to be Whitney Artworks, um, and then was Rose Contemporary um, in, the, in the back room of that. Um, and then moved to the basement of Space Gallery um, as a small t-shirt printing operation. Then we moved up two floors, and then we've been slowly expanding over the last eight and a half years. So um, it's been pretty exciting. I came in about seven years ago. The space was founded about, um, founded by a woman named Lisa Pixley, and she um, started it as um, the second community print shop in town. The, the um, primary print shop at the time um, was and um, is still remains to be a print shop in town is Peregrine Press. Um, at the time, the roster was full there, um, and her idea was to kind of create a space where 
um, uh, emerging and um, uh, novice printmakers could kind of land, and then other people who needed space could get into uh, printmaking and land there. Um, and so <laughs> there's a um, uh, so it was uh, in an effort to kind of bol bolster that printmaking um, idea. And so um, we now have, Pickwick now has almost four um, community print shops and um, countless, Portland itself, countless individual studios and um, businesses based in printmaking. So um, I, I find that print Portland is a fantastic town. Um, there's lots and lots of stuff going on here and everybody making all sorts of different kinds of prints, um, commercial, artwork, everything. So it's a really exciting, um, exciting place for a printmaker. Um, so let's see, I might want to look at my notes. Um, so I came in about seven years ago and started um, co-running the space with Lisa and um, doing um, uh, doing um, workshops and events and things like that. Um, and the two of us um, were running things um, pretty smoothly that way. Um, and it was really exciting. I came for grad school. I went to grad school at Mecca um, and um, had always wanted a place to live with a fantastic community print shop. And so decided to um, turn um, Pickwick or Portland into my hometown, uh, which has been really a wonderful thing. So that was seven years ago. Um, and um, uh, where to go from there? Um, I, as Megan Ray, uh, um, mentioned, I um, studied with David Wolf under his Master Printer Apprenticeship Program um, right after I graduated from Mecca um, with my MFA. Then I went straight in to work with him um, for two years and um, kind of filled in a lot of the gaps that um, my prior education had, um, had left. And so working with him for two years was a fantastic opportunity. And after, after such, he granted me uh, Master Printmaker status. Um, and, and that is when I also took over um, ownership and directorship of Pickwick. Um, and so that was about two and a half years ago. Um, Lisa is now starting her own um, sp special private, um, private slash soon to be public um, print shop, which is really exciting uh, in the West End of Portland. I don't know if I'm at liberty to talk about it. But what do you mean by soon to be public? Soon to be public. So there'll they'll be a storefront. Okay. Um, so space for people to go and Exactly. Yeah. So it's her. Um, it's her studio as well as she has a partner named Martha Kearsley, um, and the two of them have their their private studios there, and then they'll have a, a public open or open space um, to buy prints. Yes. Can you describe what you do there? That is, do you offer classes for yes. children and adults? Do you uh, yeah. master print for artists? You know, what yes. goes on there? Yes, so um, Pickwick is um, home to, right now we've got, got about 25 members, um, and I always call it a printmaker, a gym for printmakers. Um, everybody has a contract and they have 24 hour, 24 hour access to the space. So they come and they can use any of our facilities for letterpress, screen printing, intaglio, offset lithography, uh, relief printing, um, all of the things. Uh, we're close to the end of the of the round, and so we'll come back around. You guys have probably seen a few of the interior shots. Um, so uh, there, um, we have about five. We have three um, intaglio and relief presses, and um, three letter presses, and one offset duplicator, and um, countless other materials and tools and equipment that printmakers can use. Um, and so aside from membership, we also offer workshops. Um, the workshops have um, a, a variety of forms, but primarily we mostly do cu custom-based one-on-one um, -on -one workshops, which is a four-hour session where people can come in and learn a process top to bottom. Um, and then after one or two of those, depending on the technique, they can come and rent um, from um, rent the space either by the day or by the week or by the month where they can become members. Um, we also do master editioning with artists um, and, um, 
and that's usually a one-on-one -on -one, um, relationship where we work with artists um, until they until they have a, a print that they want to produce in multiples and then we take it from there and then produce the print. So that can look like a lot of different things. It can look like a very small piece, it can look like a large edition. Um, it's all sorts of different ways that can turn out. Um, so we've got workshops, we've got um, editioning, we've got um, commission work, just straight commission work we get um, because of um, our letterpress facilities and our screen printing facilities and the um, high skills that everybody has there. Um, we get a lot of people who are um, looking for posters, invitations, business cards, um, all sorts of printing matter. We tend towards um, uh, making uh, a lot of different kinds of things and want to really stretch the bounds of of our equipment and so we um, uh, try to push the boundaries of what a commercial shop could do oh that's our um that's our yeah <laughs> um, we also offer events, so one of the things about being a print shop in town is, um, and having 25 members, and uh, um, we have members who are just out of college, who have um, uh, just graduated with a print degree or some other degree and then and studied printmaking. We have people who have taken just a few workshops with us, and we have people who have a lifetime of experience and like the energy of our shop. And so um, we like to offer our um, our spot as kind of a platform for creative entrepreneurship and um, more than just a um, space to work but a place to sell their work out of um, and so that can happen in a variety of ways we have um, this is Mel who's DJing one of our pop-up shops so a few times a year we have a pop-up um, shop in our in our print shop where we'll have demos but we'll also have everybody's stuff for sale so right around the holidays sometime in the summer sometime in the spring um, that sort of thing happens um, thank you um, it's not changing but, but it's just awake. over <laughs> but it's staying awake so that's good um, but um, so we've got that stuff um, we also have really unique relationships with um, with our neighbors, so Space Gallery commissions us to do exhibition cards and um, they, they commission us to do um, one of our members to do a poster, a special edition poster for their, um, for their events once a, once a month for the last two years. So that's been an exciting project where they'll, um, they'll give us a list of things and then members will sign up for things and then they'll get paid um, for those for those uh, pieces and then it's a really nice collection of, of posters in the end of the year. But um, So there's all sorts of different stuff that we do and um, pretty much the, the sky's the limit. Um, and we operate very much as a community group. Um, even though everybody's working individually on their own things, it's the energy of the shop is that we're all working together and it's kind of you know, a place where you walk in and you can, you can talk to people if you want, most people do. Um, you can keep to yourself, but it's usually pretty um, a social atmosphere. Um, How many people tend to be there at any time? It's a good question, depending on the time of year and depending on the time of day. Um, uh, so daytimes usually are anywhere from um, one to six people show up. Um, nighttime, I tend to go home around seven o'clock at night, so um, I have no idea what happens in that shop in the middle of the night. But I know that things happen, and um, and uh, and they're all good things. Um, but yeah, so there's people there um, all all hours of the night, and most of our um, most of our um, Members do have multiple jobs, um, and so this is just one of their many things that they want to do. Um, and so it's nice to have that 24-hour access, so they can um, they can really take advantage of that space. Um, we also have we also work with um, artists who come in for residencies, um, usually from uh, well we ha we have a lot of different. Um, in the last year, we've had somebody from Greece come in a few times, somebody from. Um, a few people from New York, um, a few people from, um, a couple of people from Brazil. So people come to our shop to kind of um, take advantage of the, of the wider range of equipment and also the, um, 
more affordable pricing that we have um, and they um, can work 24 hours a day kind of doing a DIY residency of sorts um, and doing any sort of, kind of experimental stuff. Um, so that's a really nice um, energy that that happens or that brings to the shop. Um, Space also offers a residency, artisan residency um, every year and a, is it just not working? Um, <laughs> and gives one of those residencies a fellowship in the shop. So that's been a really um, exciting thing to have happen. That's where somebody's working right down the street or right down the hallway and then they can come in um, from their studio and work um, in the print shop. So all sorts of different stuff happens. What's your relationship with Mecca? What kind of energy? Uh, that's a great question. So um, I have um, a lot of interns. I also have an internship program. Um, most of my interns come from Mecca. Um, we also have, um, I can fix it if you want. Um, uh, we also have a fellowship program where we give, um, Mecca and I give um, a graduating senior um, a year-long membership um, at, at Pickwick in exchange for a production project um, for the school. So we've done graduation invitations, we've done um, Moleskins, screen printing on Moleskins for new admittance um, or new students who are being admitted. We've done all sorts of different fun projects for them. Um, so that's a really nice um, program that really allows students to kind of get their feet wet and um, maybe a freelance career that, they're, that they probably will start at some point or maybe commercial work that they want to do or at least some sort of you know, intensive project that they can um, put all of their newfound skills to. Um, but we have a very friendly relationship, uh, which is great um, as, a, as an alumni and also a, a, um, a itinerant adjunct. I can, <laughs> um, uh, it's a good relationship. But what, what about your presses? You mentioned how many yeah. you have. How does one go about when you had to get the, did you buy new equipment when you took over the leadership? So we have a few different presses. We have, uh, this is a medium sized press. Um, well, I call it a medium-sized press. It's actually a large press um, because it's in the scheme of things. We have um, a, a baby press and a medium press, and then we have a four by eight press um, that we built in the shop. So um, one, one thing that we do is we'll, um, we'll presses get donated to us, um, not regularly, but, you know, more than more than I thought they would. <laughs> we'll get a lot of calls asking if if we can haul something out of somebody's basement, um, and then we'll if we can use it, we'll try to soup it up and and see what happens. So you'll upgrade and get rid of a press and replace it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, we had one press that is um, that was. Um, kind of Frankenstein from a small press that we turned into this 4x8 press um, where we had, um, you saw some pictures of a event down on the street. So Lisa built this um, as a kind of uh, a um, a press that would mimic the idea of a steamroller printing event because there was a one of our events in 2006 where um, space had a block party and they shut down the um, the street and um, that was one of the, our many events out in the world where um, where everybody carved four by four blocks and then we rented a steamroller and then we printed those um, so there are some pictures of there in there but um, it was so exciting that um, Lisa wanted to do that full time. So, um, so she built this press, um, which is quite great. And she actually built it in order for it to be taken apart and then taken down to the street. So um, it's all it's made out of wood except for the cylinders, um, and it can print a four by six block um, on a four by eight piece of paper, uh, which is pretty. It's a large. It's a large undertaking to do that. Yes. Now, are you doing offering wood block and linoleum also? Yes. Do you do that too? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So we um, we do all sorts of different classes. So wood block, linoleum, letterpress, screen printing, all sorts of things. And when you when you have artists come that want their work reproduced, are you mm -hmm. finding is that mostly silk screen or? No, it really varies. Um, it depends. We did a, a edition um, that was all monotype. Uh, which was exciting and that was a really um, um, uh, exciting relationship because that was working one-on-one -on -one with with somebody who didn't have a lot of or 
you know, experience in printmaking, but knew what they wanted it to look like. So they would be on one side making plates and we would be putting it through the press and seeing what would happen. It was kind of, you know, this large format studio for this person. So um, all sorts of things like that, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I realize as you're talking there are a lot of process names yes. going around, yeah. um, which is just yes. awesome. So we have monotype and silk screening, I've heard, Intaglio you mentioned briefly. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned t-shirts, which I yes. may or may not still go on. Uh -huh. And then you have all yeah. these different presses with all of these different capabilities. Yes. So I was wonder if yeah. you might say just a bit about the yeah. what that range means yep. for you. Mm -hmm. And is that normal? <laughs> to have such a range of it, I think it's unique. Um, yeah, it's um, the kind of thing where a, a good portion of, of print shops will have a variety of equipment, but they might specialize in one to three um, techniques. Um, we, um, yeah, we have a, we have, you know, uh, there's, there's four blanket um, techniques of printmaking um, and we can we can do some variety of all four of those which is exciting um, and we also I I always um, so we have there's Peregrine Press which is the um, uh, 26 years old I believe Peregrine Press has been around um, and then there's Running With Scissors is the um, the newest press um, and they are they've been around for three years now and so we've been around for eight and a half years so I like to call us the, the rowdy teenagers of of the printmaking scene so we like to kind of really um, you know, push the boundaries as to what's possible and so we'll often if we get donated equipment we can also we see as far as we can um, we can see what we do with it so we got we um, a donated offset duplicator to us years and years ago um, and we hacked it to um, to be a relief press so we've switched all the mechanics in it and so made these plates that could fit around the drums in, or in order to do that so offset and relief yeah <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 So, so all sorts of different. What's the difference? That because I don't know if everybody already knows those yeah. words. Yeah. So um, okay. There's yeah yeah. So relief uh, relief primarily is when you're inking up the surface of a block and you're taking the, the ink off of that surface. So you're carving away anything that you don't want to print. Um, and so you're, you're printing what's on the surface of that block. Um, lithography works on a, um, a grease versus water um, principle where the ink will attach to it. It's a planar process where it's the plate is all one, one surface, one plane of surface um, and grease sticks on one part of it and the ink will stick to that that part um, and so the offset lithography usually is where that will that ink will offset onto a blanket and that blanket prints onto the onto the paper so it's a two-part process so it's kind of a, it's a right reading process which is also exciting so you don't have to think backwards so much um, but also um, you can um, you can do a variety of, of um, multiples with it. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. I'm, I've been enjoying the pictures of the various presses. Yes. And I saw the offset press and then yes. since uh, yes. the others that you've been making. Yes. But I'm impressed that you do letter press. Where do you find <laughs> block handset type yes. anymore? You'd be surprised <laughs> um, that the the basements that I that I reckoned or I mentioned earlier um, has been um, that more often than not I have somebody a student or a, a friend or somebody who will say, "Oh, my grandfather has a whole lot of stuff in his basement, um, and do you want any of it?" That kind of thing. So that's a really exciting thing. There's also there. Letterpress has been enjoying a resurgence for the last 15 years, um, and so that has been um, really exciting. So there's a lot more sources for that sort of thing. Um, in this town, there's many people who do letterpress um, printing, and so we often, I call our shop the little shop of hand-me-downs. We kind of get the stuff that everybody's sick of. Um, so we'll do a lot of trading um, of type and of things like that. Um, we also have a photopolymer plate exposure unit and so we can create 
um, photopolymer plates, which will is basically our um, kind of technological advancement mm. for letterpress printing. So we can create a digital design and then create a plate for that, and then put put that on a base on one of our pr our presses and then print print it that way. Any historic type for various places? I regret right yeah. to say, Gannett papers melted down most of their lead slugs. Yes. And they yep. didn't hand them on, I but know. some presses do. Yes. Do you have any from historic? I have, um, I have, yes, I have a variety. I'm not sure ex the exact sources of a lot of the stuff that I have because um, it does get just kind of, you know, shoved over to us in a, in a cardboard box that we then sort out. Um, but there are a variety of, um, of things that come from, like I've, I have a box that I found at Liberty Tool of a dairy farm um, newspaper um, cut all these cuts from a dairy farm, dairy farmer's um, newspaper. Yeah, so it's it's things like that happen. It's very random. <laughs> and that makes me wonder, yeah. like thinking of the odd things that come yeah. into your shop, yeah. um, equipment that gets handed down, yeah. <laughs> and then you say how you guys really like to push the boundaries of what's possible. Yeah. So how do you push the boundaries yeah. in printmaking? What, yeah. what kinds of things are you looking mm -hmm. to try to do when you say that? Yeah, so things like hacking the offset duplicator to print um, to print relief plates is one one of those things. Um, using, I mean, one of the, one thing is just using um, type, and we like to call it preservation through production, um, where we're not keeping things, you know, behind glass. There's the, there's the trusty offset duplicator. Um, that's a good guy. Um, but yeah, you can see that we've had to update it with things like that. AB Dick is the is the brand of it. Um, it is. Um, it is post mimeograph pre Xerox. Yeah, no, 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 not at all. Yeah, so um, it is, it's kind of, I call it the jalopy of the shop. It's like we get it fired up and it's like kind of jumping around and prints go flying and um, yeah, it's pretty exciting. So you just put that in historical context. So yes. she said mimeograph yes. and you said post mimeograph pre Xerox. Yes, exactly. And you guys also if I'm not wrong, a recent graph? Yes, we do. Yeah. So you guys are all like keeping everything in action, but there is like there is a history of printing yes. going on. So there what's sure, the difference? Is. What makes this not mimeograph, not Xerox, and, <laughs> and what's the risograph do? Because that's also a duplicate. Yes. So um, okay, so how to explain it all. So I'll, the risograph, has anybody heard of a risograph besides me? So a risograph is a, is a company, um, it's a Japanese company that created, um, it's uh, like the silkscreen process kind of smashed with the Xerox machine. Is it um, Goko? It's like, it's an automated Goko. Oh. Um, it is, uh, yeah, so there's, um, it's, it operates on liquid soy-based ink, um, and uh, what it looks like a, a Xerox machine, and copy machine, I guess I should say. Um, and you feed a master in, and you do one color at a time, and, um, and it duplicates, and so it, it um, uh, I don't like to talk about it a lot because they're very grumpy, and they're <laughs> grumpier than any other machine I've ever dealt with. But um, but they um, but it, it produces a, it's it's a very charming um, misregistered look is what yeah <laughs> um, is what it produces. And you have to you print one color at a time, so you can print. 300 of something, um, but you then, to change colors, you create a different master for that different color, and you put the ream of paper in, and then it, um, and then you cross your fingers and hope that it register, register, registers correctly, which it doesn't. So, um, but yeah, so it's the kind of thing, too, where you also need these um, big expensive drums for each color, and they have to stay that color. So we have, um, we have seven drums um, with our risograph, which is an exciting thing. Um, uh, but different colors act differently, and so it's um, it's like any printmaking process. It's um, what we don't like to call them difficulties; we call them normals. Um, so yeah, it's always figuring out that kind of troubleshooting. Um, and I don't have a, <laughs> I don't have a picture of the risograph because it's because it's like the least sexy machine that I've got. Um, 
Uh, this is one of, this is Irini from, um, she came from Greece. She has a, she lives, um, her mother lives in town, but she's um, uh, a, a great printmaker and she's, she doesn't have a, a print shop in Greece where she lives. So she comes here to immerse herself in, in a certain process and then, um, and then creates her work for her shows um, for the rest of the year, which is exciting. And what process is she using right this here? This is screen printing. Wow. This is screen printing, yes. Yes. Um, was there a second part of your question that well, I didn't so answer? Because I'm yeah. just starting to get really interested in. So you were saying that there's a resurgence right now in letterpress printing, yes. and there's this mm -hmm. really robust um, printing culture here mm -hmm. in Portland. Yes. Um, and so you were telling. So you've got all these different processes and are really. I love the way that it sounds like in your shop there's this really old school stuff that you, mm -hmm. you know, you don't need electricity plus, but you can also make polymer plates yes. um, in your space. And so I am, mm -hmm. I'm interested where you, where does letterpress and, um, and printmaking like this fit in the world of, of yeah. media? Because it seems like you guys do, you know, some yeah. of the sort of public facing stuff, but mm -hmm. not only. Yeah. So mm -hmm. where, where is printmaking right now? <laughs> How much time? Yeah. How much time do we have? Where is printmaking right now? Yeah. I mean, I think that's uh, that's uh, that's what we're all trying to figure out in that sense. That I mean, what I've noticed is not only a printmaker but also a teacher um, is, um, and you know, in our world of saturation and social media and all sorts of digital um, toys that we can play with, is that where we love the tactile stuff, then we miss it a lot, and then we're not we're not being raised to to really understand tactility in a way that we used to be. Um, and so I think um, people are really drawn to printmaking for that reason, and people are drawn to letterpress for that reason. Um, you know, it, there's uh, letterpress printing uh, began um, as a relief process where you're kissing the paper to the type um, and it's just just kissing the paper and so there's no impression at all. Now people really like letterpress because it it can punch into a paper and you can feel that bite of the of the impression and so um, that is this you know just this yearning that people have um, and that luckily we've been able to adapt our equipment and our papers and our, our materials in order to create that kind of tactility which is exciting. Um, so I think that I think process, the, um, the, the multi-step process um, is really a draw to printmaking. When I think about my own work there's this um, you know sometimes three steps, sometimes 27 step process for that you have to go through to make a piece and there's always a little bit of a delay in between that I have to make a decision in. So there's, um, it's an investment of time and attention. Um, and I think also about the community that surrounds printmaking. I mean, print, community print shops are, um, are uh, part of a good majority of cities and towns because um, no one, no one person, well, some people can, but most people cannot afford to have all of this equipment all by themselves, and nor the space or all of this stuff. So by sharing the burden of that, of those costs and that investment, we can all use all of this equipment. So that there's not only that expense and affordability, but also that we're all troubleshooting, we're all doing these processes together, and we're all figuring it out. And so there's a social aspect to printmaking that I think is really imperative. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And I think this, oh, was there a question on the floor? The, one other thing, because I noticed printers without borders. Yes, printers without margins, yes. I mean without margins. Yeah. So what is that? Yeah, what that's a great question. So, um, look, there's a dog screen printing. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I know, it's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so Printers Without Margins is our latest project that was born about a year ago-ish um, and it is as a community shop um, uh, individuals found themselves making printed matter um, in service of social justice causes um, as a, um, just as a part of the political climate over the last year. So, um, so as a shop we decided to get, to get together and offer 
this, um, this idea to our community and offer these ideas of, um, of we, we are people who can print things and we can print things kind of fast, ki kind of cheaply. Um, and there are a lot of people who need things. They need, maybe they need signs, maybe they need brochures, maybe they need flyers, t-shirts, all sorts of things. So um, we have two parts of the program now where people can approach us um, and we've been fundraising for, for this project and so we can um, uh, do work either pro bono or at a very low cost for people who need um, projects or printed matter in service of um, social justice work, um, which has been a really exciting and really gratifying and rewarding um, and propelling project that keeps opening up itself up into more, more things. And the second part of it is that we've just been given a grant to create a, um, a residency program of sorts for it for 2018. So we're just actually tomorrow going to launch our um, application for it on, online where um, people can, who wouldn't otherwise have um, uh, a chance to join a shop or somebody who might want to use um, the equipment to make their own printed matter. Uh, we're giving six people month-long memberships, workshops, and collaborative partners, um, all free and paid for as a part of this grant. So that's been really exciting. Yeah. Exciting. I love the way that's a spot yeah. where Signage is just, it's better if it's on paper, yes. you know, it's it portable, is. Yeah. <laughs> it's light, it's easy to carry, it says the thing. Exactly. Um, so yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, so that's been really fun. Who's the grant from? Can I ask? Uh, from the Kindling Fund which is, um, is uh, Space is the Regranting Agency. It's uh, from the uh, Warhol, Warhol Foundation for Visual Arts. Um, so they give Space um, a certain amount of money and then Space administers it. Um, it's been an exciting thing for Space to also, it's the third year in a row that um, it's been happening. And maybe it's fourth, no, third. Um, and um, so where the, this, they, the Warhol Foundation gives um, money to cities all around the country um, for similar projects, um, but we're the only f statewide um, uh, fund that that they support. So it's an exciting thing because there's there are projects all over um, the all over the state that have been funded for it. <laughs>